Michael Bandlam, the AVP for Academic Support. And in the room, Maggie, let's start with you. Oh, okay. Um, I'm Maggie. I'm in the criminal justice department and here at CELT with John. Hi, I'm Preeti Tripathi. I'm chair of the math department. Uh, Mary Ann Preston from institutional research. And John Kane from economics and CELT. Excellent. Great to see you all this morning. And I'm Kristen Croyle. I'm the dean for liberal arts and sciences and a psychologist. So we are talking about rebuilding after burnout today. So if you think you're attending a different session, I won't feel too bad if you just look. <laughs> this is not a session on AI, but those have been really good. Um, let me share my screen. And of course we are recording. So one of my favorite um, comic artist is the Awkward Yeti, which you should completely check out online. So we're going to see a, a few of his comics today. So this is Heart and Brain, two frequent characters on the Awkward Yeti. Gallbladder is also a really good one, great character. But in this one, I think this really kind of sums up what um, some of us uh, experience when we have been experiencing burnout, that you just don't feel like yourself anymore and that um, what you have to contribute is in the, kind of in the rear view mirror, <laughs> kind of hard to see, not closer than it appears, but actually farther away. So we're gonna talk today some about Rebuilding after burnout. So we're going to start with just a little review of what burnout is. So we're all talking about the same thing, but then we're going to spend most of our time together talking about some strategies. So this is a picture of a kintsugi bowl, which is um, a technique for repairing broken pottery using gold so that the resulting piece is even more beautiful than the first. And when I think about rebuilding after burnout, some of the images that come to mind for me are Kintsugi, as well as um, I have a picture later on of, a, of tree pruning. And the thing, the pieces that, the, the kinds of images that help you to think about how do I move forward when I feel like I've been kind of shaved down or broken up into pieces? How do I pick those up together and kind of take a big step forward? So let's talk just briefly briefly about what burnout is so we can all remember on the same page. Um, the, these definitions are based on Christina Maslach's work at, um, at Berkeley. Um, she and her colleagues, particularly Michael Leiter, have been studying and kind of defining burnout for the research world since the 1980s. Um, she said um, their work is really excellent. So burnout is um, an occupational phenomenon. Ah a typo on the slide, and parenthesis on the World Health Organization. Um, it's an occupational phenomenon, not an individual condition or individual weakness or mental illness. It's um, a result of a mismatch between individual capacity and chronic situational stressors on the job. And when I say a mismatch, that literally doesn't mean there's something wrong with the person in the job. It means that there's a mismatch between the two. So if the demands of the job are so high that no one could do it, that would be a mismatch with everybody. But similarly, if you put someone in a situation um, and the demands of the job are such that they completely overwhelm that person's capacity, that's a mismatch between the job and the person that can lead to burnout. And there are three components of burnout. Um, and here's some example uh, kind of questions. These are actually taken from the Maslach burnout inventory that can help you see like these, these things are part of the burnout phenomenon. So burnout is includes exhaustion, cynicism, and feelings of ineffectiveness. So exhaustion includes things like saying to yourself, I feel emotionally drained. I feel tired when I get up in the morning and have to face another day at work. I feel used up at the end of the workday. Cynicism, 
like I've become more callous and uncaring towards my students and colleagues. I don't really care what happens to some of my students. I worry that work is hardening me emotionally. Um, and I, I did tweak the language there a little bit for our setting. And ineffectiveness. I do not feel like I'm positively influencing others. I feel like I'm not accomplishing worthwhile things. I feel like I'm not helpful to my colleagues. So this combination of feeling like you're you're wrung out, that you don't really care about what's happening to other people and that you have nothing to give, nothing of value to give. That is kind of the toxic combo of signs of burnout. And not everyone experiences it in the same way. There are there some people lean more to one versus another. I lean very heavily on the ineffectiveness side and, and exhaustion, cynicism less so. Other people lean very heavily into cynicism. So there are different profiles of burnout depending on how different people kind of experience it. But these are the three key components. And as we said, this is a, a reflection of poor job person fit, and that can be across a number of job areas which we won't talk about in detail, but it can be things like having very little control in your role, having a mismatch between your values and the values of your employer. Um, some of us in previous positions have felt that strongly and you hear it sometimes from your colleagues. I had to leave that place because they were going in a direction that I couldn't agree with. Um, a mismatch with community. Sometimes that can include um, being in an environment where colleagues are not emotionally supportive, when where that's something that you know that you need, and so on. And of course, there can also be additional factors that can contribute, like um, caregiving responsibilities that increase your stress outside of the workplace. If you have a previous job history that's particularly traumatic, um, it can kind of just keep peaking up when you're experiencing burnout in a current role, and so on. So that's some of the background. So let's let's just there we go. Are we all on the same page? We talk about moving forward. Any questions or thoughts before we talk about moving forward about how burnout is conceptualized? Okay. So I got my tree pruning picture here. You know, it's really hard to find good tree pruning pictures besides cut here. Um, this one is an apple tree and it's an illustration of how to prune an apple tree for kind of central growth. And if you've seen, or if you do your own pruning, if you've seen something that needs to be significantly cut back because it's diseased or it's been damaged from weather or it's like growing in completely the wrong direction, those poor trees that National Grid prunes to let the power lines through, when they've been significantly cut back, you can use, they look like they've just been, really been through it. But pruning is intended to strengthen the plant so that when it continues in its growth pattern, it grows into a beautiful, healthy um, apple tree or whatever in the next stages. So this is this is also one way that I like to think about burnout, that it's like it's like being pruned. And when you are cut down or cut back, how can you think about how you're going to grow into this beautiful, healthy next stage of your life after being cut back like that. So we're going to focus on four sets of strategies. One, the first one is refocusing on our why. The second one is exercising our own power. The third is taking care of us. And the fourth is... Um, overly optimistically called antidotes. It's just a bigger word than the smaller concept. But you're gonna do some writing for yourself. So take a moment. In fact, I didn't take a moment. Take a moment, grab something to write on and with. Let me grab a pen for myself. There we go. And if I was an influencer, I would be like, look, we have a pen for writing. <laughs> okay, you ready? 
got something to write with, something to write on. Yes, you can do this on your phone or electronically or whatever, whatever, however you like to write, but it's just for you. So let's talk about refocusing on our why first. In fact, let's spend a few minutes just making some notes for ourselves. The reason I, I wanna start with this is that um, refocusing on your purpose, the thing that brought you into your role or the things that thing that excites you about your job or the things where you really think you made a difference. Um, sometimes, particularly women, sometimes it might be hard for us to say, here's the thing I'm really proud of that I can do, but it can be easier for us to say, here's the thing where I really feel like I've got it. Like I feel um, powerful or I feel like I'm better at this than other people. Like the thing that I can point to that says, this is, this is where I'm strong. So think about what, what really brought you into your role, what excites you about your job, and spend um, a few minutes noting this. And I'm going to put myself on mute and start a timer so I don't get overly excited about moving us on. Any surprises there or was, did it, surprises only in the sense of what kinds of things came to mind? Anything you wanna share? You don't have to, obviously, but if you would like to, is there anything you'd like to share? I can say something. There, I'll just turn it towards you. Hi, Kristen. I can share if uh, great. Nobody's speaking up right now. <laughs> so, um, what brought me to academia? It was uh, basically knowing that I understood my subject pretty well. And that it was exciting to talk to others about it and uh, help others be able to understand a subject area that's typically considered like a weed out kind of subject. And um, I think uh, at least uh, from the country where I come from, uh, education really is about empowerment 
and uh, that's what excites me and uh, makes me feel like I make a difference. Thank you, Pretty. Would anyone else like to share anything? Um, <clears throat> there's a there's a comment in the oh, chat yeah. from Laura. Yep. Laura, thank you so much. That's a wonderful comment that um, Laura disclosed her disability to the class that she was working with. And one in one section in particular, so, several of those students disclosed their disability to her when she was walking around and helping them. And I can see why that would be something that, where you see the difference that you're making in almost in real time. For me, what attracted me to psychology, so clinical psychology is a, you're supposed to, the traditional training model, there's three prongs. You're supposed to research and teach and practice. Those are the three prongs. Um, but not everybody does all those things. And what initially attracted me to was to help people change their lives through practice and research. But as I moved into teaching early in my career, I could immediately see that the students, the students that I was working with them and many of the students that we work with now, they're lives will take a huge step forward, including their standard of living and their ability to support their family and their communities, a huge step forward with a bachelor's degree, that that really does, as Pretty said, it's, it's a question of empowerment. And that's the piece that keeps me coming back to work every day, that, the, that what we do changes on an immediate, almost immediate basis for students can change the course of their lives in a way that can take them out of poverty, that can get them reliable health care, that can change the way that they think about the world and reduce prejudice and discrimination. All kinds of things are outcomes of higher education. And that's the work that we do. I want you to hold on to those notes because when you can refocus on your why, it gives you the boost of energy that you need when everything else is sucking down your energy. I actually keep um, several copies of this little card, which you can't read, so don't read it, uh, <laughs> of this little card that I wrote up for myself um, when I was reflecting on this um, a few months ago so that I can remind myself and I keep it around my office, so I run into it every so often. But this, this is what it is that keeps me coming back to work. How about exercising our own power? How can we exercise our own power in a way to help us to step beyond burnout? Um, and by this, I mean that we often have power and control in our work that we're not using that we can leverage to build up pieces of ourselves and the pieces that we love and reduce the aspects that are rubbing on us and creating that burnout. So what kinds of control do we have? For example, we often have much more control over the way that we use our time and how much time we spend at work. Um, one of the examples that some of you might have heard me give before is that I, I worked with a faculty member years ago who was really just a really lovely woman, but she said, I don't even have, I don't have time. I'm meeting with so many students. I don't have time to go to the bathroom or to eat. And I said, well, these are, for one thing, that's terrible. That's terrible. <laughs> but for another thing, these are appointments that you are setting up with the students that you're supporting? And how did you think that they're responding when they see that you don't have time to go to the bathroom and that you don't have time to eat? She had more power over, she actually set her own schedule, but the demands of the job felt so present and urgent for her that she was unable to set time to have lunch 
And you know what happens if you go all day without eating, especially this, uh, especially if you're medically vulnerable. So we talked together about how she could protect her time in a way to protect herself. And the in for her was that it was a good example for her students that she was teaching them how to care for themselves if she would say, no, that's the time that I eat lunch. And this is the time that I take a, a, a quick break and walk around the building so we can meet after I get back. But how can we can protect our time? Um, how are you carving out no work time in your in your week or in your annual cycle? If you're on um, a 10 month contract, are you taking vacation time when you have vacation? Um, not literal vacation because that's not contract contractual, but you know what I mean? Are you taking vacation sometime in the summer? Are you going, are you take, doing something fun when you have breaks in the semester? Are you working 24 seven? Do you, do you do email on the weekends? I don't do email on the weekends though. I do have an alert set up for a few people that might email me that it would be urgent. So I get the notifications just about, just from those people. But I don't, I don't typically do email on the weekends. Um, how, uh, what else can we do that we can protect our resilience? Um, periodic refocus is also something that we in academia sometimes have a greater ability to do than people in other work. This is more true for faculty than for staff, but it's also true for staff sometimes. And the reason is, if you were to list out all the things that you could do to contribute in your current role, it would be way more than one person's job list. It would be a job list for four or five people, probably. I could do these things. I could do these things. I could do these things. And you can only do one person's job. You can't do all the five people's job. And because there are so many different ways that the university could benefit if you contribute, it often means that we have flexibility to refocus in, periodically in our role without um, like having to change our jobs or apply for a new job or something like that. The easiest example here is for in faculty roles when they pick up um, uh, significant service. So um, I used to work with a department chair who used this periodic refocusing as a way to address her own burnout. That um, she was a faculty leader and was um, very well respected so she chaired FA, this, this is not here. Although I'm sure all the same things could be said for Liz, this is not Liz. Um, she chaired FA because uh, she got some court, a course release for it. She had some good ideas. Um, and then after a while that, that got kind of stressful and some of the, the rubs of that, of that position um, started to weigh on her. So she stepped down from that, went back to full-time teaching. She did that for a while. She really enjoyed her students, but they got kind of annoying. <laughs> you know what I mean, not in a bad way, but <laughs> when you're teaching a lot of students semester after semester, sometimes they get a little annoying. And so she wanted to take a step back from that. So she picked, so she became department chair, picked up another heavy service responsibility, reduced her teaching. She said she pushed some papers around, support her colleagues. That went well for a while. And then when that started to get irritating the demands of her colleagues. She start to, sh started to feel that they were more minor and more of an irritation. She stepped back from that, picked up teaching again. So she would, she would kind of press on the gas in one place and on the break in another, several, in, year, in multi-year cycles. And this was a way that she kept herself fresh, that when she had good ideas in one place, she would lean one way or lean another. Um, sometimes, although um, staff certainly have less flexibility in their roles, they also many, our staff also have really incredible ideas. And sometimes if they step forward with a great idea, there's a way to step forward on those pieces and step back from another piece in a way that can help us to periodically refocus and to um, kind of refresh. Let's also talk a little bit about meaningful work. Um, You might have heard of Google's previous practice that they may or may not be following anymore, where they would give people a day a week to work on the thing that what their crazy idea that was exciting to them. This was also studied in doctors, not 
a crazy idea, but meaningful work. So Tate Schoenfeld and colleagues studied about 500 physicians um, in, and published in 2009. And they asked these physicians what aspect of their work was most meaningful to them. And for some, they said it was, and these were um, academic physicians. So for some, they said it was teaching medical students. For others, it was doing research or working with patients, for mentoring, lots of different activities. And then they asked them what amount of their work week was in each activity. Okay. And there was a strong inverse relationship to burnout for the amount of work week that they spent on the activity that they considered the most meaningful. So physicians who spent 20% or more of their time, so about one day a week in an average work week, physicians who spent 20% more of, or more of their time in their most meaningful activity had half the burnout rate as those who did not. There did seem to be a ceiling effect that if they spent 60%, it was not a, a dramatic difference in burnout rates, but it should be at least 20%. So if you think about what aspects of your job you consider to be most meaningful, which we just wrote about like five minutes ago, how can you arrange your work week in a way that you spend at least 20% of your time on those activities? Um, when I was an assistant professor, I, I have never liked writing alone. That is just not a thing that I appreciate. And if you need to, if you want to get your stuff published so that you can get tenure, writing alone is an important activity because even if you co-author with other people, there is a lot of alone writing time. And honestly, I just really don't like it. I just don't like it. So if you had asked me as an assistant professor, what is your most meaningful activity where you should spend at least 20% of your time? I would have said writing and I would have been wrong. As I would have said writing because people kept telling me that I needed to find a lot of reward in writing alone because if I didn't, I wasn't gonna get tenure, which is a bad thing. I mean, I really did wanna get tenure. So I was conflating what's important for the job with what I found to be mean meaningful. And because of that, it was a constant struggle for me to try and force myself to write. Instead, I, need to find, I needed to find ways that filled up my energy capacity so that when I wrote, which was not my favorite thing to do, my, my tank was full. So I could do the writing with this full tank. And part of the ways that I um, found meaning was that I really enjoyed mentoring research students and seeing them kind of come into their own power as, as research scientists. And then that would lead to data. And then I would have something to work on to write. <laughs> so where do you find meaning, the most meaning? And can you find a way to carve out at least 20% of your time to focus on that? To fill your tank so that you can do the rest of the stuff. So you still have your notes, right? So take, take a minute to add to your notes. What work do you find to be the most rewarding in your role? And how can you carve out at least 20% of your work time for that activity? So that's, that's about maybe an hour and a half a day across the week. or a full day. So spend a couple minutes writing about that.
Does anyone have anything they want to share on that? And of course, you're not required. Want me to go, Kristen, again? I don't want to steal somebody else's time. I don't think you're stealing time, but you're welcome. You're very welcome. No pressure, though. Okay, so um, when I was uh, uh, not a chair, I think my most exciting thing to do was to kind of plan out my classes and then go and enact those out. But uh, since I have become chair and it's been about a year, um, one of the things that I find um, most rewarding, most exciting is to uh, kind of figure out the strengths of individual faculty and to see how that can, um, how I can help them to move forward with that uh, strength in a way to kind of benefit the whole department and of course our students. So to kind of uh, move our mission forward. Excellent. Thank you. And to me, both of those sound like you enjoy strategy, developing strategy that people respond to where you can help raise them up with that strategy, whether it's in the classroom, I'm going to develop this way to reach these students and, and help lift them up, or I'm going to develop, or, or if it's with your colleagues, I'm going to, I'm going to think about how to approach these people and work with them and develop policy or individual mentoring to lift them up, support them. Yeah, I think that would be fair to say. I, I just want to jump in that, Preeti, that, that just resonated with me because as somebody who's in a new job and I'm trying to figure out what my role is, um, it's been it's been tough because it's been, do, I'm doing so much so many different things and my, and I, I didn't even write that down, but my strength is just what you said is working with my staff to find their strengths, you know, and lifting them up. Um, and it's a different role now, but I, I feel like I can go back and start thinking more about that and mm -hmm. trying to do more of that. Cause I'm, I'm still getting my feet under me in this job. So, um, I understand <laughs> Michelle and I empathize with that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we both, you started chair when I started this position. And so trying to figure out like what my role is and it's it's so different. And so, um, but it doesn't have to be as different as I think I'm making it out to be. So um, so this whole thing has been very interesting. I'm like, hmm, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. yeah, how do I do that? How do I re refocus what I'm doing? And, you know, I'm starting in a position that somebody else was in but it's the type of position that I can refocus to be more towards my strengths. So, which I've done three times now, so I can, I can do this. <laughs> so you can do this. I That's can right. do this. <laughs> so thanks. And thank you, Kristen, for kind of um, unifying what we were saying. <laughs> Allison, do you want to add? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I was kind of reflecting on this. My why has been consistent since I was an RA as an undergrad and an assistant hall director as a grad student and now. And I just love working one-on-one -on -one with students, helping connect them to resources, helping them with strategies, resources, and support to help them meet their individual goals. So the ways that I am able to do that in my work are just having like individual conversations with student staff, um, our desk attendants and our tutors. And I'm now at the point where I also feel like I can, you know, help mentor like newer colleagues um, as they're adjusting to the institution and like learning the ropes and um, helping, helping them like see ways to get involved in different things and the opportunities for committees and professional development. So um, and I guess, I mean, I, I can do that at different times 
during the day just by walking around uh, the tutoring center and and by chatting with people. And um, there's other times when, you know, students come into my office and they, you know, they're seeking me out to chat as well. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for mm -hmm. sharing. Okay, shall we? All right, we're moving on. Thank you, Freedy, Allison, and Michelle. Appreciate it. Uh, we got another heart and brain interaction here. I don't know if you can read hearts list. That's it's got pet small animals, pet medium animals, and a horse, dolphin question mark. <laughs> Too. <laughs> so we're going to talk about taking care of ourselves and this is not meant to be another list for you. That was the intention of putting in that heart and brain interaction. Taking care of ourselves is important because um, burnout is a kind of chronic stress that really that is physically and mentally very stressful and it puts you at risk for all kinds of things. We're not going to go into all of those things, but anything stress-related burnout puts you at risk for. Um, so building your physical resilience, your social connections, and your life outside of work are all ways to strengthen your body and your mind so that you are um, a little bit, it's a little bit easier to be that kind of Teflon, let it roll off kind of um, kind of person. So building your physical resilience, like keeping an eye on what you're eating, making sure that you're prioritizing sleep um, and getting some kind of regular physical activity, even <laughs> and on an extremely small side, making sure that you're taking um, some time to look far away and rest your eyes for a few seconds uh, every 20 minutes. So ways to build your physical re resilience, building your social connections is also an important piece of taking care of yourself um, and building your life outside of work. Because one of the things that um, burnout can sometimes uh, manifest as is um, with the exhaustion, right? Sucking all the energy out of you. It can be easy to think of yourself as only that person because you only have the energy to do the one thing, but you are not your job. And the university is not your family. We love you, but not in the same way that your family does and your friends do, your chosen family. So finding a way to build, to, con to continue to build or to rebuild your life outside of work after burnout. So um, where have you excelled here? What are some things that you're doing where you've really prioritized your outside of work self or ways to take care of yourself physically or mentally. What are your next steps in taking care of yourself? So let's spend a couple minutes there. Why don't you make a, cup of, a few notes for yourself. Where, what have you done really well here? And what are your next steps in taking care of yourself?
Okay. Keep keep writing, keep adding to it. Um, would anyone like to share in the chat? We'll give, we'll give 30 seconds for folks to add it something if they want to add something to the chat. Sorry, can I just say something again? Yes, please. Well, so I wrote down, uh, you know, I did answer your question, uh, where have I excelled here? So I work with my own cycle of, you know, sleep and waking up and all that. So I pay attention to that. Um, I read a lot and some, some of it is just, you know, fiction, which helps me and social connections, etc. I mean, I did make time to meet my friends outside of um, the college people that I know and you know, friends among college people as well. But it did occur to me that I can do that now when uh, my son is grown up and kind of independent. And I see that a lot of the audience here is women. And it was definitely very hard to do any of this when my son was very young and you know, I was uh, kind of bringing him up as a single parent. So, I kind of empathize with people who are very young children and are uh, primarily, you know, caregivers as well. Thank you, Preeti. Stephanie, you want to add? Sure. Um, for me, it's been um, a, a real strong commitment to physical fitness and physical activity, um, which is something to kind of piggyback off of what Preeti said, something that I got into um, relatively seriously before I became a mom and decided after I became a parent that that was the one thing that I was not going to sacrifice that I like kind of refused to to give up um and I was lucky enough to find a gym that offered child care so um you know I bring my daughter with me to the Y uh you know several days a week when I go and it's just been a really wonderful way to not only manage my stress but just feel good about who I am and you know it's a social place um and the opportunity to kind of feel stronger physically and mentally has been really beneficial so um that's one of the things that I do excellent thank you thank you both and we've got one addition in the chat making time even a small amount of time Sarah says for a hobby and and for next step planning to reach out to reestablish friendships and starting to exercise Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. I think I may have. Aha. Another, la our last heart and brain interaction here. The mental health bar going down and down and down as brain is on his uh, pineapple phone, I believe. He's got a pineapple there. And then heading out into nature. So this is antidotes, which is really too ambitious a word. But all of these things, each one of these individual activities that, um, is a proven almost immediate stress reducer. Some have a small effect and some have a larger effect. So ways to build antidotes in, in a purposeful way. So experiences of flow, for example, flow, um, is a well-researched phenomena in which you, it requires your complete mental absorption and you lose track of time. So for example, musicians often experience flow when they are practicing, where they're completely mentally absorbed and they lose track of time when they're working on something. Artists can experience flow um, uh, martial arts practitioners. This is the this is the experience of being completely absorbed by your activity. And experiences of flow are in a, in a small piece an antidote to burnout. They they also can some for some people can um, lead to feelings of awe, kind of that I'm. I'm in awe of the universe or of this piece or of this beauty. 
which can also be a small antidote to blow, to, to uh, burnout. Group activities in which there is um, some interaction can also be an antidote. So yoga, for example, yoga is a great stress relieving activity because it, it often um, incorporates uh, an experience of flow as to really focused. Um, it can be physically healing in some ways, but people who do yoga in a group as opposed to individually can also get the benefits of being with other people. Um, what Stephanie was talking about, about prioritizing her physical health, but also being in a group setting to do it, you get special benefits because evolutionarily we are group creatures and we do better with groups. So when you do things that put yourself into a group setting where you're all doing the same things, um, people who are religiously active, who have a religious community that they're frequently in can get benefits from just having those people around them, everyone focused on the same thing and so on. Thank Being you. in nature, even just taking a walk outside as our heart and brain comic said on a regular basis can reduce levels of stress and burnout. And humor is a, a quick one. So humor actually refreshes you in multiple ways. When you see something funny and you laugh at it or you experience a little bit of humor, it can um, immediately reduce your stress a little bit. It can, uh, there's even evidence that it can reduce your decisional fatigue and increase your willpower when you laugh at things. Um, the fatigue of having to um, make those decisions over and over or say no to something over and over, humor can kind of refresh that. Um, but I will add, uh, if you use humor to feed your burnout monster, it does not have the same effect. So cynicism, remember, is part of burnout. So if you're feeling cynical about your colleagues and your students, and you lean into humor that makes fun of students or professors, it tends to increase your burnout over time rather than reducing your burnout because it's making you more cynical over time. So um, given that we're, we're, close, we're close to time, I'm gonna give you your prompt, but you're gonna write on your own. Don't forget to write on this one. Where have you excelled in your antidotes? What are your next steps in developing your own antidotes? And while you make a couple of notes there, um, I am gonna share my slides with you. I'm gonna say, thank you. Let me grab. Let me grab my sharing link so I can put it in the chat. Hold on. Okay. I can also email it if that would be useful to you. Yes. Okay, I will also email it. It was wonderful to see you all today. Good, um, my very best wishes to all of us in our continuing journey to regrow, fill out those branches after our burnout experiences. It really is wonderful to see you and I hope you're having a wonderful summer. And I will see a couple of you at 10 o'clock when we're gonna be talking about something completely different, which is uh, group work that works. So good to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.